So I want to talk to you today about the list of leaders on this wall right here. So when we think about great leaders, what names come to mind? You think about Nelson Mandela, you think about Martin Luther King, but then also not necessarily positive leaders for the world, but also leaders that are influential, Adolf Hitler. I would say that these leaders had two experiences. They shared one very similar and some of them had another one. The first one is they all spent time in prison. The second one is many of them wrote while they were in prison. Martin Luther King, notes from a Birmingham jail. Nelson Mandela, long walk to freedom. Unfortunately, Adolf Hitler, Mein Kampf. Now, I would say that it was being in prison that made them the leaders they are today. So because of that, there's a bus waiting outside for you guys, and we'll all go to, well, I really can't put you in prison now. But what I can do is have you think about what was it about their time in prison, and how could you put yourself in prison in a way to influence your own leadership characteristics? And the first one really comes at when you're in prison, all of the craziness of the world, all of the sort of normal routine goes away. So what are you left with? You're left with time to think. And one of my favorite quotes is a quote by Albert Einstein. He says, no problem can be solved by the same consciousness that created it. That's where we get the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. So what Einstein is saying is, you can't solve your own problems. Why? Because you created them. So for you to start thinking about how to solve your problem, you have to think differently, come up with a new consciousness. So as you start thinking about this issue of consciousness, and how do I actually sort of have my own jail theory of leadership, I want to give you some things to think about. The first one is, I really want you to start accepting or raising your hand for this challenge. And so often when we look at that previous list, many people say, I couldn't be like them. They're special. They're unique. Uh, I was at a conference once where they were talking about defy the ordinary, as if those people are less ordinary than you are or more special than you are. But what if they were just you? So this is Martin Luther King. And one of Martin Luther King's sort of his last speech was sort of our been to the promised land speech, and we all know that speech, and because he died the next day, and people say, wow, that was so prophetic that he said that he may not get there with you, blah, 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 blah. I think they missed the part of the story. The part of the story really starts with there were threats about, because there actually were threats as he was leaving the plane from Memphis, from Atlanta to go to Memphis. People were worried that they were gonna put a bomb on the plane. And there were also the threats. You know the Martin Luther King story. People were bombing his house. But he says, that doesn't matter to me now. Because like anybody, I'd like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go over to the mountaintop. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. We as a people will get to the promised land. And here's the key part. And then he says, and I am happy tonight. And that's an interesting shift of consciousness. He starts by saying there are threats, and he ends by saying he's happy. So was he just crazy? Was he just delusional? No. I think he said, isn't it amazing that I'm clear who I am, and I'm clear on where I'm going, and I get a chance to do that? I'm leaning into this. Just about every sport that you can think of, this is the counterintuitiveness. I used to coach 9- and 10-year-old boys football. Now imagine, the kid that's bigger than you is running toward you with the football, and the coach is going to say what? Go make a tackle. Most of us want to do what? Get out of the way. Well, basketball, you've never caught a ball. I'm going to throw a ball at you. What's your first instinct? What does the coach say? Lean in. Even if you're in a car and you're on ice and you start to swerve, what's your first instinct? Turn the car away. What do they say? Turn the wheel into the actual skid. So maybe the first step to you thinking about your consciousness is to actually lean in, to lean into the damage, to lean into the challenges in front of you. Why? Because you recognize that that's what you're here to do. So what was Martin Luther King here to do? He said it, do God's will. What was his vision? He said it, it was the promised land. Messages he had said over and over and over again. So while he didn't wish for the challenges that was in front of him, he was clearly leaning into this opportunity. So as you spend your personal time in prison, maybe start thinking about, how do I lean in? But then the next step is, what do you want to lean into? This is a picture of Mother Teresa. And I love the story of Mother Teresa, because after she died, 
people started saying how uh, prophetic she was, how charismatic she was, how she was a saint, she wasn't like us. But that would be a disservice to her if you go back and look at her biography. She was born in 1910. Her actual name, Agnes. Somewhere in the 12, 13, 15 year old age, she had her first sort of calling. I want to be a nun. That sounds like many of us, somewhere in high school, we decide what? I want to get a job, I want to go to school, I want to do something. She leaves Albania, goes to Ireland, ends up in India, 21 year old, wanted to be called Teresa with an H. That name was already taken. So they said, guess what? We'll give you Teresa, no H. Now let's find Sister Teresa, 21 years old, teaching school in India. And we'd say, guess what? In about 45 years, you're going to be this amazing person. What do you think she would have said? I'm no Mother Teresa. <laughs> and then we catch her with her second epiphany. Now she's teaching school in Calcutta. But she sees bad things happen outside the wall. And she says, you know, I understand I'm here to teach school, but there is a challenge outside of the wall. I think I want to lean in to go solve that. She goes to the principal. That's not what you're here to do. She goes to the school ten superintendent. That's not what you're here to do. She eventually goes up to the Catholic Church. That's not what you're here to do. And she says, guess what? Just so I'm sure when God asked me, can I say you said no? They said, hey, you can go. But I can't give you anything to show you're part of the Catholic Church. They didn't give her seed money. They didn't give her an office to start with. So now we catch her in 1950. She's 40 years old now. And we say, guess what? In about 20 years, you're going to be this amazing woman. All the kings and queens and presidents of the world will come see you. What do you think she would have said at 40? I'm no Mother Teresa. And it gets worse. Do you have a dollar? Because she was looking for money to start the thing she was interested in. And then for 19 years, the world doesn't see her. Why? She's just doing her work. She's just helping those in the streets, give them dignity as they're dying. And then somewhere around 1969, she gets this video from the BBC, and then the world comes and watches her, Nobel Prize, dies at 97, and we go, wow, she was so special. Wow, she was a saint. Or maybe she was just someone that got more and more conscious. She leaned in and started getting clearer and clearer and clearer on her platform. So then the second question for you is, so then what's your platform? What is that thing that you're going to lean into? Not because the cameras are on you, but because that's the thing you want to do. If you know her story, there were actually some critics of her. So they thought, why is she helping those that are dying? Why not help the babies? What do you think she said? Not my platform. Why are you helping those that are dying? Why not help and protest the government? Why not go to other parts of the world in the beginning? What does she say? Not my platform. So there's something about you getting clear on your platform. Again, taking your time in jail to make sense of that. Now, one more piece of this is, so then what are you looking for? What are you trying to go make happen? So these are my two sons, Marvin and Miles. We knew they would be short when they, were, when they were born. I'm six feet tall, mom's five feet tall. So you do the height weight chart, it tells you that by a certain age, there'll be a certain height. They're like dead on. Miles is about five six, Marvin's is about five eight. But in their minds, they wanted to be a basketball player. Now the dad in me wants to say what? Ah, that's a tough thing to sort of want to do because you know. But then I realized they didn't ask me if they can be a basketball player. They told me they wanted to be a basketball player. So they started looking for opportunities to be a basketball player. So if you lived in the southeast part of Edmonton between about 2010 and 2013, you would see these two crazy boys dribbling two basketballs everywhere they went all over. They would dribble two basketballs to school. They would dribble two basketballs home. They would shovel the, sh the snow on their block in order to dribble basketballs. Why? Because if you're five foot six, and want to be a basketball player, you better be a really great dribbler. Now, they could complain about their height. Oh, it's not fair. Or they could say what? I got to go figure out how to make this thing work. And in a sense, isn't that how we started everything? We started everything by raising our hand. Please give me this job. Please admit me into school. Please give me this opportunity. And then we get there, 
And when it gets hard, what do we say? Who wanted this job? Who asked for this opportunity? I hear it all the time. I can't believe there's an 8 a.m. class. To which I say, didn't you sign up for that 8 a.m. class? <laughs> so in a sense, what work are you doing? So what's the benefit of getting clear and conscious, deciding your platform, and then getting work? The benefit is, then you shine. Marianne Williamson has this quote, our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is the light that, dark, that frightens us, not the darkness. We often think we're afraid of failure. I think many of us are afraid of success. How do I know that? Ask anyone around you, hey, how's it going? Oh, just getting by. Oh, I'm just making, how's work? Oh, I'm so busy. Because that's just the dominant conversation we have. But then she goes on to say that if we shine, we give others permission to shine. So if you started saying, hey, today's a good day. I'm on my platform. Are there challenges? Yes, I'm leaning in. What will happen to other people? They'll start saying, today's a good day. Are there challenges? Yes, I'm on my platform. I'm leaning in. So my gift to you is that if you can find some time to put yourself into jail, to actually think about this, you think about those things. Thank you.